Hi Year 11 and welcome to your very own Love Poetry Revision Guide. Love Poetry and how to be brilliant about it weaponized for your exam after Easter. Now I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about each of these poems because you've got full mini lectures about them on the drive from all your favourite teachers from Noah Hill. So I'm going to go through maybe some new ways of looking at them, making sure we know how to weaponize them from exam conditions, and then how we put them together in a really clever way. So part one, being smart about the individual poems. The first thing to remember, and so many people lose marks for this, is what I've written all over here, context is a third of your marks, a 33% of your marks. So you have to remember to talk about context, both in the single poem and in the comparison. You've pretty much only got 20 minutes. You've almost certainly got too much annotated on every one of your poems. You need to just pick the smartest bits and talk about them in the most intelligent way. So summarise the poem's approach to the theme. If the theme is love, which it is, then how is this poem approaching love and what's unique about it? Put the poem and author in context and explain how that shapes the poem's approach to the theme. Again, never just say the context, say how that shapes and adapts the way the poem is approaching the theme of love. Explain the form and structure and how they reflect the poem's approach to the theme. Every single one of these is very easy to find clever things to say about that. People are often scared of talking about form, but it's really easy with these poems. Comment on the title in most cases. I've made notes of where that's important and where it's not. And then analyse. I've said three to four moments here, but it's more than that really, isn't it? You're just embedding those little references to the poem as you move through it, maybe, you know, four to six times, maybe eight times, maybe ten times if you're working tons of single word quotations in, but making sure you've got something from the beginning, something from the middle, and something from the end. Um, and important note, this means that you really can stop freaking out about any one of these four poems that you find hard, because all you need to do is to be able to write about each one for 20 minutes. So, first poem, She Walks in Beauty. Now, my context for this is a little bit different than the context that you've probably been taught, or that you will see if you go to any one of the many millions of BBC Bite Size or GCSE podcast or anything available to help you with these poems. Um, you know, I'm sure, that Byron wrote this poem apparently after seeing his wife's first cousin at a party, etc, etc. Um, the more interesting way to approach it, and certainly the way that, that brings a lot more meaning to the poem, is that while it was first written in 1813, it was first published in 1815 in a book called Hebrew Melodies. So somebody else, Isaac Nathan, wrote the music to accompany all of these poems, and Byron contributed the lyrics, the poetry. So this poem first appears in the world attached to the idea that it is a uniquely Jewish collection of songs and music. So therefore that explains an awful lot to us about the type of beauty he's representing in that poem, certainly how his 1815 audience would have taken it. So forget the cousin thing for a minute, think about the fact that this is a collection of Jewish poetry, a poetry about ethnic people written about by white British people. Um, the other thing about context that's useful here is, and I'm sure you remember this too, is that Byron was very famously scandalous at this point. He was mad, bad and dangerous to know. He'd have to leave the country in disgrace um, not long after this because he had allegedly um, slept with his half-sister. Uh, he was notorious, much loved, but also much hated throughout the country. So not really what we associate with this very calm, measured, you know, love poetry that we're about to see. It doesn't really go with his personality. Key form for Byron, what makes it a song? What makes it song like? Well, it's in iambic tetrameter. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, right? doesn't change pace throughout, it's a walking pace, it's a sing-song melody. Um, and what to say about that? Remember, it's never enough just to spot a feature, you're always saying why that shapes the poem's approach. Well, this one is very much a performance. It's more like a thought experiment, writing about a beautiful woman, rather than a representation of emotion. As you'll have seen in other discussions in the classroom, as you'll see briefly when I touch on it, he never writes about this woman, he doesn't know this woman, he's just writing about the outside of her face and the fact that her forehead makes him think she's nice. There's no real emotion here at all whatsoever. Um, if the beat is the beat of Byron's heart, 
the beautiful woman is not making him break a sweat. There's nothing excited here. Um, I think probably all of you have received a copy of this sort of annotated guide to the anthology that we nicked off another school. Um, any of those sorts of things, anything your teacher's given you, your own annotations from class, they can help you pick out different bits that you know you can sound clever about. What well, I'd like to approach here using the memes that um, my students made, the one at the bottom there, uh, that meme goes with the kind of standard piece of context you've been given. The one at the top here I'd like to look at, which is that if we understand this poem as something published in Hebrew melodies as about a particular Jewish female beauty, then what we see here is Byron very much discussing ethnicity, the color of someone's skin, and um, why he finds that strikingly attractive. If that strikes you as racist and weird, congratulations, you're correct, right? She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies. Where are cloudless climes? In the Mediterranean, in, um, in the, the Middle East, in Israel, right? All that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. So her darkness, the darkness of her hair, the darkness of her eyes inform everything about that first stanza. Then in the second stanza, the bit that my students normally get the most irritated with, one shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired that nameless grace. Um, if it was a bit darker, if she was a bit darker, if she was a bit lighter, she wouldn't be so namelessly beautiful. But as it is, she's just right, which is why my students made that colour swab list for her skin tone. Uh, raven tresses, another thing there that's racializing her, showing us what ethnicity she is. And in that last stanza, um, it sounds so nice, doesn't it? And yeah, as he'll have discussed in class, really what he's saying here is, she's got a really nice face, and that tells me everything I need to know about her personality, and possibly the most insulting bit, on that cheek, over that brow, forehead, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent. So eloquent, meaning, um, speaks very beautifully. Of course, she doesn't speak. She's just walking while he looks at her from the side of the balcony, writing his poem about her, uh, using the word eloquent to describe her. He doesn't actually interested in her voice. He's not talking with her. He's not talking to her. He's just writing about the way she looks. Hashtag toxic masculinity. So here it is. I've got it summed up um, in that way I said you should use as a framework. Summarize the poem's approach to the theme. Speaker sees and describes a woman he does not know. It's a non-intimate poem in which women are understood solely through the male gaze. I've got a note there. A male gaze is the term for a perspective that presents and represents women as sexual objects for the pleasure of the heterosexual male viewer. He's just looking, right? This is all about what he sees and what value he sees of her. A uh, poem and authoring context, first published as Hebrew Melodies, a romantic author, remember romantic is a period, not an adjective describing love and romance. Romantic author Byron frames the woman as Jewish and his description of her dwells on her ethnicity and appearance rather than personality. How does the form and structure work? Well, the iambic tetrameter, the poem moves at a walking pace just like she walks. Byron states calm and unemotional, it's set to music, so it has a song-like rhythm. Um, and then there's nothing clever to say about the title, is there? Uh, just pick out some moments. For me, I would talk about the cloudless climbs, um, the raven tresses, like the night, how he's positioning her very specifically against darkness, a lexical field of darkness. Um, then I'd get really annoyed about that eloquence bit and talk about that. So that's your Byron. Um, he's an astonishing literary figure in history. I don't actually think this is one of the best of his poems. Next up, Valentine. Now, Valentine can be very frustrating to mark what you guys say about it. Um, and one of the reasons is an awful lot of teaching resources out there floating around on the internet, including this one, um, not mine, obviously, but the one we've nicked off another school, say some very strange things. What they tend to say is that Valentine is um, a critique of the material aspects of romance, the unrealistic, materialistic aspects. And instead, Carol Ann Duffy shows us the reality using this unconventional metaphor of the onion. And as I've said here at the top, no, 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 no. No, this is not a normal relationship. This is not realism being presented to us. It ends with a knife, people. Normal relationships do not end with a knife. They don't end with jealousy. They don't end with, they don't have someone forcing tears upon anyone. Um, this is, do not confuse this with Caroline Duffy, it is a dramatic monologue. 
So what's a dramatic monologue? It's a poem that presents the speech or conversation of a person in a dramatic manner, a bit like a soliloquy in Macbeth. But unlike a soliloquy, in this one, the speaker is talking to the person who's being given the valentine, right? It's being given the onion. How do we know that? Well, as I've said here with the pointless terminology alert, we have DXs all over the place. You don't need to remember that or use it unless you want to do, um, you're doing Langlet next year. DXs is the use of language that makes no sense unless both people are present. Um, so if I say, give me that, you need to be there to, to know what that means. And we have that at several points here, right? Every single time there's a break between the lines, the speaker is gesturing, handing something to, motioning at, the, the person who we never hear who's listening, here, like that, take it. It's very aggressive gestures. Speaking of very aggressive, this kind of guide will tell you that using imperatives is a sign of confidence, is not a sign of confidence, it's a sign of the coercion and control going on here. Um, so again, lots to say about that, but your main thing here is do not confuse this with Carol Ann Duffy, and do not think that this is supposed to be a representation of a normal, non-toxic relationship. This one is deeply messed up. Top tip for context, um, one of our least favorite things as teachers is to hear you say, Carol Ann Duffy is a lesbian. So that is why the poem is like this. That makes no sense, people, none whatsoever, right? Um, it's not enough to say that she's a lesbian. It is useful to talk about the way in which Carol Ann Duffy in this poem and in many of her other poems takes apart heterosexual relationships, heteronormative, we'll look at that word in a second, relationships, and looks at really toxic, violent um, examples, and how the mythology of romance and myth and flowers and June and moon is at vast contrast with the bloody reality of some very toxic heterosexual relationships, okay? So here I've kind of put that again in its more formal context. So in the poem Valentine by contemporary poet Carol Ann Duffy, love is presented through an unconventional approach that challenges assumptions and the customs of the holiday. Now, that is what you'll have in any random research guide found online. The next bit is, is more specific. I'd like you to keep in mind, this dramatic monologue is delivered by an unnamed, increasingly aggressive speaker who invokes images of death and violence. Poem and authoring context. A lesbian poet laureate, Duffy challenges the meaningless romanticism of Valentine's Day presents, offering instead the extended metaphor of an onion as a gift with all its negative connotations of tears and pain, right? That's as far as you normally get. So the next bit, in doing so, she questions the cheap romantic love narratives of heteronormative culture and depicts jealousy, coercion, and violence. Just as elsewhere, she has written poems about Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. I've got a picture of Hindley and Brady sitting at the side there. They are the Moore's murderous, infamous couple serial killers from the 1960s. Um, she writes about them. She writes about murder uh, at the end of relationships, often in her poetry. Heteronormativity is the belief that heterosexuality is the default preferred or normal mode of sexual orientation. So it's not so much that she's critiquing heterosexuality, she's critiquing all of the cultural stories around it, right? Form, structure, and how it reflects approach to the theme. This unconventional subversive approach to heteronormative society is reflected in the free verse form of Valentine, a dramatic monologue which refuses to conform to the expected structure of love poetry, notably a sonnet. So we've had two love poems so far. One of them has been a song, in iambic tetrameter. One of them is in free verse. Neither of them have been in the form we most closely associate with love, the sonnet. But the next one we're about to look at is indeed a sonnet. Here we have Sonnet 43 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, again, I've got a screenshot there. There's a whole lecture about Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Sonnet 43. You can look it up anywhere online. So I'd like to give you a little bit of rather more pointed context to think about what's interesting to say about this poem, because it is actually sneakily one of the most interesting poems in the anthology when we think about it in context. Elizabeth Barrett Browning writes this in 1850. Um, it's two years after massive revolutions have broken out across all of Europe um, with people striving towards democracy and liberal reforms, getting away from monarchies and stuff. So politics is in the air radical religious changes in the air, <coughs> and rather crucially, women aren't writing poetry, 
it's not socially acceptable for women to write poetry. It's just not something that they particularly do, especially not love poetry. Love poetry, the role of women in love poetry in 1850 is to inspire love poetry by walking around looking beautiful, just like in Byron, not by actually loving and writing poetry yourself. I've got a quotation there from Elizabeth Barrett Browning describing what she did when she was thinking about becoming a poet. She says, England has had many learned women and yet where are the poetesses? I look everywhere for grandmothers and see none. So in this poem, Elizabeth Barrett Browning is inventing herself as part of the literary canon. That's a phrase we're gonna use later. Um, that is the collection of books which have stayed in print, which schools and universities and culture generally have decided are the best books that were ever written. And it may not surprise you to know that those books tend to be books written by the same kind of person, a person a little bit Lord Byron, white dead men is the shorthand that people use as a joke when they're describing it. So what is Elizabeth Barrett Browning to do? Well, she writes a sonnet and she writes a series of sonnets and she writes a series of numbered sonnets. And in doing so, she is modeling, taking after the form of the most famous love poets in the English language. Um, especially William Shakespeare with his famous numbered sonnets. So by calling it Sonnet 43, she's making a huge claim for herself. And how else is she demanding her right to be allowed into literary cultural conversations? Well, I mentioned that it was 1850, there's revolution in the air. And she uses these abstract nouns drawn from the lexical fields of politics and theology, right? How do I love you? I love thee freely as men strive for right capitalized abstract noun there, right? So I love her, I love you freely, democratically, just like men across Europe are striving to be, have democratic rights and the right to vote. Again, not something women are supposed to do. Um, same thing, uh, one of the first things she considers, she's talking about grace, the act of being saved in um, Christian theology. Women aren't supposed to write about theology, they're just supposed to go to church and do what they're told. So in these three instances, both the very form of the poem itself um, in the fact that she's talking about theology and in the fact that she's talking about politics, she's really making a claim for herself. Now, the, the most striking thing for me about this is a love poem. It's one of the most famous love poems in the English language, and yet it doesn't talk about her husband at all, does it? How do I love thee? You would expect it would be a poem about how much I love you, darling. If someone told me they'd written me a love poem, I would hope it was about me, but it's not, it's about her. It's all about Elizabeth Barrett Browning's capacity to love and her capacity to write poetry and her capacity to feel salvation and religious doubt and, and political freedom. So an unconventional love poem in that sense. It might be very famous. It might be in sonnet form. But at the same time, it's really not about her husband, Robert, at all. It's all about her. In the structure, which I hope you're now used to, in Sonnet 43, Barrett Browning explores the nature of the love for her husband, Robert Browning, using the semantic field of religion and politics to describe the quality of her love. That's our kind of summary. Poem and authoring context. Barrett Browning breaks the convention surrounding Victorian poetry, making a claim to her right to be a female poet and to use poetic forms traditionally exclusive to men. She uses a lexis of rights and belief to explore and quantify the nature of her own feelings in the process asserting her rights to be part of national conversations and international ones. Form and structure, again, this one's fascinating because by claiming her right to use the sonnet form, specifically the Petrarchan sonnet, you don't need to know that, but if you want, you can. She breaks the conventions surrounding Victorian poetry, making a claim to her right to be a female poet and to use poetic forms traditionally exclusive to men. The sonnet title should be, you should know exactly what I'm about to say by now, by writing a sonnet cycle and numbering her poem, she puts herself in the canonical male tradition of Shakespeare and Petrarch. Um, I've got a couple of things to sound clever about there, both of which involve terminology that you really don't need at all whatsoever, but both of which are useful concepts, don't need the language of it. So why does she say, how do I love thee? Do people in 1850 say thee instead of you? No, they didn't, right? So thee is deliberately archaic, old fashioned, out of date, and it's deliberately poetic language. So by using that, she's immediately showing her ability to adopt poetic techniques and use a poetic voice. That's my insulin alarm, one second. 
the drama of having a diabetic teacher, right? Um, and then the second one is is that thing I was talking about where the poem actually sort of doesn't do what you expect. It's it's called hypophora. Ignore that word at the beginning. It seems like it's going to be a conversation. How do I love thee? Starts off as a question. Does he get a chance to say a word? No, he does not, because it's closed off by her answering her own question. This is a meditation on herself rather than a love poem, right? So in all three poems that we've had so far, we've had the beloved object, the loved one, the person being stared at, has had their voice not shown or taken away, or in the case of Byron, elided altogether. We've just got eloquent cheeks, remember? Byron's poem irritates me. <coughs> Last poem. Cozy Apologia for Fred. Now, we would normally refer to this as Cozy Apologia, but both those things are part of the title. It's the only poem, this last one by Rita Dove, that is directly dedicated to someone, and that is not a normal thing to do with a poem. But like, a, like Elizabeth Barrett Browning, this one's addressed to her husband. Um, as you will have discussed endlessly, Cozy Apologia is an oxymoron. The two words are completely different. So cozy is domestic, informal, and apologia is a formal, legal, or theological defense. Um, one thing to know, kind of crucially, as you'll see on my next slide about Rita Dove, is that she's an academic, right? So she's a professor. Um, she has studied literature, she creates literature, and she's very, very, very aware of the history of romantic literature, the history of love music and romances and representation in film and representation in other poetry. So we see this all over this poem, which in many ways is one of the most difficult in your connection. Um, she uses language that it would probably take me a, a term an undergraduate to really make you be comfortable with like this post postmodern age is all business so she moves between that very low frequency high register academic language and then much more sort of conversational colloquial rhythms in other places and that matches the apology versus the cozy um again you'll have all kinds of guides to this just just a little correction from me on here in case in case one of these brain worms has has eaten yours it's not unusual that the hurricane is called floyd because hurricanes usually have female names they don't usually have female names they switch alternate between male and female names it's odd that we gender hurricanes at all that's more her point um your key word here i think and the reason why this one is a very unconventional love poem too is that it's quotidian right that's a fancy way of saying daily or ordinary Quotidian events are the everyday details of life. When you talk about the quotidian, you are talking about the little things in life, everyday events that are normal and not that exciting. For example, this lamp, the wind still rain, the glossy blue, my pen exudes drying mat upon the page, right? It is in the quotidian that Rita Dove is considering her husband in the boring, in the opposite of romantic. Um, so we've got a first stanza, where she thinks about um, all the kind of stereotypes from the history of romantic literature, knight in shining armor, cowboy rescuing a, a trapped damsel, etc. We have a fairly fixed rhyme scheme at the beginning, lots of couplets um, and, and, you know, A, B, A, B rhyme scheme all over the place, but, and that messes up, she's playing with it. So couplets represent simple coupling, rhyming, rhyming that falls apart, meter that falls apart represents her thinking more about it. When it comes back together again at the end to keep me from this melancholy, call it blues, I feel this stolen time with you. She's back to being a couple. It's a fairly obvious pattern that you will have annotated to death already. But let's look at that in my preferred format. So in Cozy Apologia, Rita Dove considers glamorous cultural stereotypes about romantic love and teenage infatuation and the ways in which her quotidian love for her husband is different. Poem and author in context, Dove was the US poet laureate, an African-American academic and poet. She approaches the history of Western depictions of romantic love as both an intellectual historian and a woman with real experience feelings. Um, the strict couplets in the first stanza break down as Dove moves away from literary and cinematic stereotypes she's using. And then, of course, the oxymoronic title um, that, that you all know what to say about there. So, like I said, this is an intimidating poem, but actually it's easy to talk about for 20 minutes. And as we'll think when we look at it next to some of the other poems, it's easy to compare cleverly as well. Let's look at comparing them. 
Well, all of them have an unexpected approach to love poetry, right? So I've, as I've summarized it here, and that's Byron um, playing, doing some cultural appropriation there. Um, oh, Byron. Uh, Byron's, it's supposed to be a love poem, and yeah, it's really just saw a hot chick's face, wrote a poem about it, that's the end. Uh, Carol Ann Duffy, is it romantic if I kill you? No, it's not, Carol Ann. Uh, Barrett there, Barrett Browning, with her terrible worst haircut of all time, the 1850s. I feel very sad for any woman in the 1850s because they all look like they had spaniels ears. Um, let, you, let me tell you about how my mind works, right? You thought I was going to tell you how much I love you. I'm going to tell you about my mind. <laughs> and then possibly my favourite, Rita Doves, actually you're really boring. So all of them have really unexpected, subversive, deliberately subversive in the case of Carol Ann Duffy, just a bit cheap and and crass in the case of Byron, um, a really kind of extended meditation on the right of a woman to feel, to think and to love on the case of Barrett Browning. And then from Rita Dove, um, a, a long lyric consideration of what it means to actually love someone instead of to be in love with someone because they are boring and doing their work in their office, but so are you. So it's a sort of middle-aged love poem. Uh, now, I've said outsiders to the white Western male canon of love poetry, but Byron is most definitely not an outsider. Byron is Mr. Canon, right? He's he's the reason why he's on your syllabus. The reason why you have five different romantic poets is because the Secretary of State for Education decided that romantic poets were like Brussels sprouts for Britain's young people and that you all needed a healthy dose of them so that you could fill up on the white Western male canon of love poetry. Um, However, he's also an outsider in some ways. I mean, this poem doesn't really reflect any of his own genuine emotions. He had to leave the country because he was notorious, right? So he is an outsider in that sense. But he's also useful to think about as being that white Western male canon of love poetry. If he is what everybody else is trying to get into and find their own place within. So Carol Ann Duffy, she's breaking the mold by being a working class lesbian woman, um, poet who nonetheless becomes poet laureate but in all her poetry she's considering the history of poetry and how people like her haven't really been allowed access to it didn't get published and what it means for her to be writing that poetry within it elizabeth barrett browning as we've seen women couldn't weren't expected to write poetry at all their job was to just be what byron's looking at whatever he's looking at out of frame there a lady that he's just seen that he's writing a poem about but elizabeth barrett browning wrote poems herself Right. And Rita Dove, uh, the, obviously the white Western male canon of love poetry does not include black women. But Rita Dove coming in as an academic, as the national poet of the United States at the time, making her own place in a new kind of canon. So all of them have a relationship to that idea of the canon of poetry. Uh, very specific links between some of them. Both Barrett Browning and Dove's poems are wives writing poems directly addressed to their husbands. So that's a very obvious and instant link. Um, they're both two poems that, instead of being about the husband, turn out to be reflective accounts of how the author's heads work. Right? So Rita Dove is writing poetry about poetry. She's describing her pen moving on the page. She writes about this post-postmodern age. She stops and considers her own teenage years and who she was infatuated with then. They're both writing about their capacity to love or how love works for them. And there I've got at the bottom, uh, in the middle rather, both poets reflect on how their childhoods and early years shape their experience of their love for their husbands. So really, both of them have huge autobiographical components and both of them are about themselves. And context comparison, both are outsiders to the white male literary canon, both reflecting on the nature of writing love poetry, right? So all of those things. These two, um, very big contrast. Uh, I mean, Carol Ann Duffy is a stark contrast with all of them because hers is a dramatic monologue. So it's not, it's not written from the perspective of the lyric perspective of a pretend lover as in Byron's or the everyday quotidian life of a wife like Rita Dove's or um, the, the woman sitting at home trying to find her right to speak in a literary voice. Very, very personal. Rita Dove's is is a drama, a mini drama. Uh, one's a dramatic monologue with a male speaker, one a personal direct address to the poet's husband. Both are critiquing, however, and taking apart the cultural stereotypes of heterosexual romantic love in their poems. So that is everything that Rita Dove is looking at, is that, you know, like I said, knights in shining armor, 
trapped damsels and rescuing heroes, this idea of how relationships between men and women work and what love means between men and women, as well as what it means when you're a teenager. Um, and instead finding, uh, Rita Dove finds a more, more equal, you know, they both have their own offices, they're both professionals, they both work. Um, how does it feel to love someone when you 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 don't have any literary models for that, right? And both poets are outsiders to the Western white literary male canon, and both poets are poet laureates, right? Neither of them are anymore, but both of them were at the time. Specific links with um, Byron. Byron, of course, contrasts with all kinds of people, but especially beautifully with Barrett Browning and Dove, because Byron is writing about surface level attraction. Dove talks about surface level attraction when she's talking about those, those boys in the second stanza, um, the boys she compares to Hurricane Floyd, which becomes an extended metaphor for teenage infatuation and crazy romantic love. So the way I phrase it there, one of them writes about seductive boys who move through your life like a hurricane, and the other one is a seductive boy who moves through people's lives like a hurricane. Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. You can use Byron as your comparison boy for, for all three of these poems in some ways. Um, one poet's at the heart of the white Western male literary canon, one is outside it. One sees women of color as sexual objects, one is a woman of color. Right, so so he compares very beautifully there, and then if we think about the form, and this is the last slide, I'm wrapping up now. I promise, and no more alarms will go off. Um, we've got four very very different, unexpected or expected ways of approaching a love poem. Obviously, Elizabeth Barrett Browning writes a love sonnet, and that is the most classic history of poetry way to do a love poem. Except that. Her love sonnet is really more about her own mind than it is about her husband, right? It, it's more being in love with the person she has discovered she is because she has her husband to love, right? Um, Byron there, who I'm going to say, just there's no real emotion in Byron whatsoever. It's, it's a joke to call it a love poem, and we see that reflected in the iambic tetrameter. It's sing-song, it's stayed, it's designed to be sung, it's, it's a fictional piece. It's just the male gaze staring at the outside of someone's head and writing a poem about it. There's no love there whatsoever. Nothing of the quotidian. He's what everybody else is writing about, right? He is what everybody else is going, well, if that's love poetry, how am I supposed to write loved poetry? One of them has ruptured meter and rhyme scheme to show that she is rupturing and, and breaking up this mythology surrounding romantic myths that go with days of the year like Valentine's Day. And uh, one of them has, well, and that one actually applies to uh, both Dove and Duffy. I wrote that one for Dove, but it works for Duffy too. Um, Duffy doesn't really have meter and rhyme scheme in there. So that more works for Dove. Um, one of them's free verse. Both of them therefore are using form and meter to represent how they're breaking apart the history of love poetry. Right now, I hope that was useful. Remember, you've got all the individual poem lectures, and that's just a way of thinking about how they all relate to each other. Remember, they are, to go back, all people with very unexpected approaches to love poetry. And then you can talk about what those unexpected approaches are and how they compare. Okay, All right. good luck and carry on revising, and we will all see you soon.